there was a report in the British press earlier this week about the difficulty that um, school children are experiencing from Belgium, France, and the rest of um, the European Union in organizing school trips to the United Kingdom. Uh, there was a, a certain amount of uh, regret expressed, obviously, that this should be the case. But I think that most commentators miss the point that this is an essential element of Brexit to establish cultural barriers between the United Kingdom and the EU, the rest of the European Union. Uh, it's sometimes assumed that something like this, sort of a, a difficulty created for school children, is not part of the plan. It, it's something which is a regrettable glitch or blip of Brexit. Um, but it isn't. It really isn't. It, it's part of the way Brexit is supposed to work. And the cultural aspect is, is important. Uh, all the UKIP speakers that I ever heard in the period leading up to the referendum um, spoke very hostilely and very virulently about the Erasmus program, which they regarded as an attempt culturally um, to create uh, the idea of a, a European citizen, uh, someone whose identity was European rather than British. Uh, obviously, today's Conservative Party is the heir uh, of UKIP, uh, and it's well aware of the importance of uh, cultural links and the breaking and making more difficult of cultural links between the United Kingdom and uh, the European Union. I think that on a number of occasions over the past years, um, commentators have looked down the wrong end of the telescope at things that were happening in the Brexit negotiations. I think they underestimated the radicalism, indeed the, the revolutionary fervor uh, of the people who were making and uh, motivating conservative policy on Europe. Uh, that goes back to the point about uh, triggering Article 50. It's quite a common uh, analysis you hear today that Theresa May triggered Article 50 too early and did it without a plan. Well, she wouldn't have been allowed by the Conservative Party to get away with postponing any longer the triggering of Article 50, because the plan uh, of the Brexiters uh, who run the Conservative Party is to get out of the European Union. Uh, what comes after is of secondary importance. It was necessary to trigger Article 50 when it happened uh, because the fear was uh, that there might be an indefinite delay. Trying to work out a plan for the period of, of relationships with the European Union after Brexit uh, really wasn't the concern of the Brexiters. Um, they knew intuitively uh, that there wouldn't be a possibility of agreement among themselves on any plan, and it would only hold things up much better to get the notification done um, and see which way the cards fell after that. There was much too much optimism on the part of the Brexiters and um, that the European Union would be divided, that it wouldn't be capable uh, of standing up to the might of British diplomacy. Um, but that wasn't the primary consideration. The primary consideration was that uh, uh, it needed to be done as quickly as possible because Brexit is the policy. When, Mrs. when Theresa May, talked about Brexit means Brexit. Um, she was saying what, in a different understanding, exactly the Brexiters wanted her to say. Similar misconceptions, in my view, prevail about the willingness or the determination, uh, the decision of Theresa May to exclude membership of the customs union and the internal market. There's some uh, nostalgic um, uh, wishing uh, for a different outcome, that it might have been possible for Theresa May um, to mitigate the effects of Brexit um, by taking the United Kingdom or remaining for the United Kingdom within the internal market and the customs union. Uh, I think once again that that's a, a naive and over-optimistic view. I think that she had no chance of taking her party with her if she had gone down any such path. And indeed, there's a certain logic from the Brexit point of view. Jacob Rees-Mogg talked about vassalage of being within the single market or the customs union. That's flowery language, but it's not entirely wrong. Uh, there is a, a sense in which the United Kingdom would have remained a, a rule taker, not a rule maker, outside the European Union if the customs union and the sing single market uh, had been negotiating goals uh, of, of the British negotiators um, during the Brexit um, period. Uh, that, I think, was always going to be unacceptable to the Conservative Party. 
And I don't think it matters, um, ironically, uh, whether Boris Johnson understood the details of the customs union or not. What all he needed to know was that the customs union was a, a unifying bond with the U European Union. And that is what Brexit sets out to break. Um, the breakage uh, is much more important than the reconstruction afterwards. When we got to the withdrawal agreement and the TCA, um, similar, I think, uh, misconceptions prevailed. There was a view uh, that when Boris Johnson accepted the withdrawal agreement, um, he did so because finally um, reality and good sense had impinged uh, uh, upon his Eurosceptic ideology. That, I think, is an oversimplification. I think he wanted to have an agreement, almost any agreement, in order to be able to win the 2019 election. Uh, and very soon after that election, he was telling Conservative MPs uh, that the effect of the negotiations after the withdrawal agreement uh, would be such uh, as to uh, undermine all the principles of the withdrawal agreement, in particular as far as Ireland was concerned. That was always fantasy that somehow in the year of 2020, it would be possible to negotiate so fantastically um, a favorable arrangement with the European Union um, that the Irish protocol, in essence, will become uh, otios uh, and unnecessary. Um, but um, the effect of this um, reckless promise um, to the most radical Eurosceptic elements within the Conservative Party uh, has been very severe. And that effect has been that there are many, many Conservative MPs who don't, do not regard themselves uh, as bound morally, emotionally, politically um, to the carrying out of the withdrawal agreement uh, and the trade and cooperation agreement which follows from it. Uh, this is particularly true of Ireland. Uh, and as always, um, Ireland uh, crystallises and makes clear um, the most um, uh, problematic uh, most dangerous aspects of, of Brexit. We've had Dominic Cummings telling us uh, entirely plausibly um, that he and his colleagues um, particularly regarded the Irish protocol uh, as being something that needed to be undermined, needed to be got rid of um, as soon as the negotiations for the withdrawal agreement and the trade and cooperation agreement were completed. Uh, this is a very cynical view um, but I think it's a widespread view within the Conservative Party that uh, the binding of the United Kingdom to the extent that it still remains through the Northern Ireland Protocol and through the Trade and Cooperation Agreement to the EU is something which has continuously to be chipped away at, to be denatured, to be denied. Uh, we're having a lot of speculation now uh, about whether Article 16 will be triggered uh, of the uh, Northern Ireland Protocol. My own fear is very much that it will, and that this will lead to a, uh, uh, a, pro a retaliation by the European Union that might even lead to the abandonment of the Trade and Cooperation Agreement. I don't know whether that's going to happen or not, but what I do know is that if it does happen, it will not be an accident or a, a pity, a glitch in the Brexit process. It will be something that many people within the Conservative Party think is the appropriate outcome of Brexit. The withdrawal agreement and the trade and cooperation agreement, um, from their point of view, allowed the European Union altogether too much residual power in the United Kingdom. And it also imposed upon the United Kingdom uh, the payment of debts. Uh, which, uh, for one reason and another, many Brexiters don't regard as legitimate claims upon the United Kingdom. So if we do end up with the Trade and co Cooperation Agreement being a casualty uh, of Article 16, um, that won't be uh, uh, an unwanted or unsought for outcome uh, of many people who are motivating conservative policy towards Europe. So when we, we look at the, this background of um, uh, a very radical, uh, a very uh, determined um, group of people uh, calling the shots on conservative European policy, um, what conclusion should we come to? Uh, I think the first conclusion we should come to is that um, advocating uh, to uh, rejoin the single market and the customs union um, is never going to uh, cut any ice with this government. 
Um, there are symbolic and ideological reasons why they want to be outside the internal market and the customs union. Um, and it seems a, a slightly lame response um, to be saying, we think we should join the single market, uh, perhaps as a, a, a precursor to, um, to rejoining the European Union entirely. Um, seems much more sensible to me, much more economical um, to put forward the view that rejoining is the only way of mitigating the harm that is done by not being in the European Union. Uh, halfway houses uh, are liable to end up pleasing nobody. And the government will have powerful arguments against the customs union and the single market, which I've alluded to before. These arguments will derive from sovereignty and the reluctance to share sovereignty with the European Union. There are arguments, of course, about sovereignty sharing, um, but there are arguments which are much better and more easily deployed in the context of rejoining the European Union rather than a, a halfway house uh, of being a part of the internal market, but not part of the European Union as, as, a, as a whole. The second conclusion I draw is that the relations between the European Union and the United Kingdom uh, are going to continue in their present fractious state, and in fact, be likely to get worse, um, because it's the only glue holding the Conservative Party's present electoral co coalition together. Uh, if the British government, Mr. Johnson's government, were able to bring about economic changes, um, very significant economic changes, the levelling up agenda for particularly the north of England, then that might be a different matter. But I think it's very unlikely that they'll be able to do so. I think that come the next election, if the Conservative government is to maintain its present rather fragile uh, electoral coalition, in which certain elements of the previous Labour electorate have lent or given their votes to the Conservative Party, then it will have to be uh, on the basis of, of a, a, a nationalist call to arms figuratively at least, against the European Union. Uh, identity, uh, the politics of identity are very important here. Uh, and the Conservative Party has spent the past two or three years always complaining uh, that the European Union is um, too legalistic, it's to blame for any problems that arise from Brexit, uh, and that uh, its desire is to punish the United Kingdom rather than to uh, defend its own interests. Um, all this uh, is, is rhetoric that, that can't be dialed down, it seems to me, uh, and will we'll continue. And the final conclusion I draw from, from all this uh, is that uh, Brexit uh, is infecting uh, areas of our political life and political culture, which go beyond the simply economic and trading. Uh, Brexit isn't a policy like any other where you can agree or disagree or perhaps favour some aspects of it and not favour others. Um, it's so firmly based in mendacity and uh, fantasy um, that it infects all our political life. And I think we have very good examples of that recently in, in the concerns about sleaze. Uh, if you have managed to sell uh, such a, uh, a pup, um, such a, an extraordinary proposition to the British electorate, as Brexit, um, you will be very tempted to think that you can get away with everything else as well. There has come from the Brexit referendum, from its clear manipulative um, and dishonest tactics, um, the sense that politics is a game played by a very limited number of people um, who are not over concerned about truth or, or reality, um, but have the right to take the decisions uh, on behalf of others. Brexit is a profoundly elitist project in the guise of a popular project, and that's its, its fundamental paradox. And that paradox um, equally leads to a, an indifference um, to accepted standards, to normal codes and patterns of behaviour. Um, sleaze and Brexit seem to me to be two sides of the, se of the same coin. Intuitively, many people, opinion polls show, uh, realize that, uh, and the desire to rejoin the European Union uh, remains very strong in spite of the fact that no politi major political party is campaigning for it. Uh, over the next 10 years, uh, there will be a decision. 
will the electorate accept the, the, the reality of Brexit and become bored with it and unwilling to contemplate rejoining? Or will, on the other hand, the direction of causation be inverted? Will the political parties um, come to understand that there's political advantage and advantage for the country in advocating a clear rejoin message? One of those two things is going to happen over the part next 10 years. Uh, and I don't think there's any more important choice uh, for our political system. Does our political system uh, have the wherewithal to cure itself, our party political system? Or, or is it um, in such a bad and dysfunctional state that it can't cure itself? Those who live longest, as ever, will know most.